So we're going to start our discussion by covering what is concurrency. And we'll talk about some of the key concepts associated with concurrency and concurrent programming. So I'll talk about the concepts and then we'll also just kind of do a, a segue into the programming material that we'll be covering in the rest of the class in the next part of this lesson. So let's start out with the fundamentals. What is sequential programming? And, and chances are that's how you started in computing. My, my guess is if you took CS 101 at Vanderbilt or something equivalent somewhere else, you probably began by focusing on sequential programming. And sequential programming is a form of computing that executes the same sequence of instructions and always produces the same results. Assuming, of course, you don't have buggy code. So you can kind of think about, you know, I, I love analogies as you'll discover. So think about people waiting in line at a drive through restaurant and each order is processed sequentially one by one. So people aren't like swerving and cutting in front and trying to get ahead. They're just doing things in a, in a queue, which is basically a sort of a first in first out queue. The idea behind sequential programming is that the execution of the program is deterministic. And that of course assumes that we're not using randomness in some way. We're not using a random number generator to, to decide what to do next. But if you just write a normal program and we'll look at an example in a second, and there's only one thread of control, then your programming will be sequential. There are two primary characteristics of sequential programs that are important in our discussion. And of course, what's important in our discussion is to be able to compare and contrast sequential programming from concurrent programming, which we will do in just a moment. So the first characteristic is that the textual order of statements specifies their order of execution, or at least as we'll see their logical order of execution. So here's a very simple example. If you take a look at the Java class library source code, you'll see that there's a, there's a class called array list, which is an implementation of list, the list interface. And there's a method called get, and you pass in an int, which is the index you wanna get. And what it does is it first checks to see if the index is in range and assuming that it is, because if, if it isn't, it'll throw an exception. Then it goes ahead and returns the element that is at the indexed location. And in a sequential program, the range check method must be called before the element data method. Now that seems sort of obvious at one level, right? You're like, well, what the heck else could it be doing? But I'll show you in a second how in a concurrent program, it could be somewhat different. So that's number one. The textual order of statements specifies their logical order of execution. And then the second characteristic is that successive statements must be executed without any temporal overlap that's visible to programmers or programs or end users for that matter. And the idea here is that things go one after another, at least logically. Now that doesn't mean that there can't be some really clever reordering taking place behind the scenes for example, at the assembly code level or the pipeline cache level and so on. And so without getting too far off on a tangent, modern platforms can do instruction level reordering for pipeline purposes to keep pipelines from stalling. But whatever gets done, those reorderings will not be visible to the programmer other than perhaps your program runs a little faster, but it's not gonna change the meaning or the semantics of the output. So things have to go sort of one after another, which is really what sequential means if you stop and think about it from everyday life. So with that as background, let's now talk about concurrent programming. So concurrent programming is a form of computing where threads can run simultaneously. And we'll see that there's a couple of different meanings of simultaneous. One is logically simultaneous, where you may have multiple threads sharing a single core and they're time sliced or swapped in order to let them run on that single core. Then there's also physically simultaneous, which says I've got multiple cores and therefore these threads can really physically run at the same time. Concurrency doesn't really care uh, which whether it's logical or physical simultaneous. The only thing I will say, however, is if you run your concurrent program on multiple cores instead of a single core, any bugs or hazards or race conditions or atomicity issues or whatever will show up a lot faster because things really will physically run at the same time. So here's a very, very simple example where we're going to have a loop that iterates for i equals zero, i less than five, and it's gonna go ahead and 
create a new thread and run some computation in each of the threads. And what we show here on the right-hand side of the slide is a little round angle that's gray with five little squiggly thread-like things with little arrows and in indicating an instruction pointer where we're executing in that thread. And so what that suggests or what that defines a thread to be is as a unit of execution for instruction streams that can run concurrently on one or more processor cores. Of course, a given thread will be running on a given processor core at any given point in time. But over time, threads can move and run on different cores as, as the underlying operating system scheduler may determine uh, they need to do the, the preemption and rescheduling and context switching and resumption and so on of how the threads execute. So the key point is a thread is a unit of execution and it runs in the context of something called a process. And that gray piece there is the process. Threads can be multiplexed over one core, though this is increasingly rare. Most of the time nowadays, we can have multiple cores on our laptops, on our desktops, on our cloud-based servers, on our mobile phones, on our tablets, et cetera. And I represent cores typically as little Apple cores. So those are cores. You can have concurrency with a single core, and then it does what's called the, the logical simultaneous processing. They could be physically simultaneous. They're both concurrent. And increasingly, it's hard to find hardware that only has a single core because of the Moore's law characteristics we talked about before. Now, one of the main differences between concurrency and sequential programming is that different executions of a concurrent program can produce different instruction orderings. And what that means is the order in which things run may be non-deterministic. Whenever I talk about non-determinism, I always show dice in indicating like, you know, gambling. You, you might win, hit the jackpot, you might lose your shirt. It's non-deterministic. It depends on the roll of the dice. So in particular, unlike sequential programming, where the textual order of the source code defines the order of execution, or at least the logical execution, with concurrent programs, the textual order of the source code doesn't necessarily define the order of execution at all. So here we have a little program that spawns three threads. The first thread runs computation A, the second runs computation B, the third thread runs computation C. And the order in which those threads run is really non-deterministic. It may be deterministic from the point of view of the underlying hardware and operating system and so on, but you from a programmer point of view don't really know and really shouldn't care what order those instructions, what order those functions run in, those computations. And that's because concurrency is inherently non-deterministic. Another thing that's different about concurrent and sequential programs is that operations are permitted to overlap in time across multiple cores. So if I have three cores, each of which is running different instructions, in that particular case, then the computations running on the different cores can overlap in time. One can be running in one core, which is overlapping when another computation is running on another core. So they really literally can be going physically at the same time. And that also, of course, it helps to improve performance. It also is an indication of non-determinism. And if it, you don't handle things correctly, it can also be a source of many concurrency hazards, which we'll talk about shortly. In modern, practice, especially for mobile devices or user interface based environments on a desktop or a laptop, concurrent, program, concurrent programming is often used to offload work from the user thread or the user interface thread, the UI thread, to one or more background threads. That's exactly how Android works. It's really how pretty much any, any various uh, type of user interface framework behaves. Typically, the UI facing tasks run in one thread the main thread or a designated user interface thread, and longer running computations have to run in the background. Why is that? Well, the threads that are running in the background can afford to block because they have their own execution context, they can have their own stream of instructions, they can block on various resources like a file IO or network IO or various synchronizers or long running database operations, whatever. So background threads can afford to block. However, the user interface thread cannot afford to block because it doesn't want to be non-responsive or unresponsive to the user who may want to quit, 
may want to switch their focus to do something else, some other activity, some other task, et cetera. So the basic model is the user interface thread is used for short running operations that can't block and the background operations, the background threads are used for longer running operations that may decide to block. And we don't care because they're running in the background. Now, the minute you've got more than one thread, you've got a whole new set of fun things to wrestle with. And that is, how do you share information between the different threads? For example, if you've just downloaded a file in a background thread, how do you communicate the result of that download to the user interface thread so it can display the result? And what happens there is something having to do with the concept of state or values of fields, and in particular, something called mutable state, which is just a fancy way of saying state that could be changed. Now, there's also immutable state, which would be something like a constant that never changes. But in this case, we're talking about mutable state, which are fields that could be changed from one state to another, one value to another. And any mutable state that's shared between threads, be they a user interface thread and the background thread or different background threads, must be protected somehow to avoid concurrency hazards. And that's a really important issue that we'll talk a lot about. And we'll talk about concurrency in Java later to get more information about that. And as we'll see, as we get further into this course, this need to protect the state is what motivates various Java synchronizers. So we have things like uh, mutual exclusion mechanisms. We have things like atomicity objects. We have things like coordination mechanisms. We have things like barrier synchronizers and all these little, little pictures will make sense as we get further along what they mean from a metaphor point of view. But basically the need to share state between multiple threads correctly and robustly and it, um, efficiently is what motivates a big chunk of what we'll be covering in this course. So that's the end of the first discussion, which gives you just a quick overview of concurrent programming concepts, which of course we will refine in much more detail as we get further on in this course.